and welcome back to the Press Start Podcast. I'm your host, Vic, a.k.a. Mr. Never Chillin', and this is episode number 24. Can't believe that already. Shout out, Kobe. But of course, I'm joined by my co-host, Roger. Hey, guys. How you doing today? So, Roger, what you been playing lately, man? Anything big so or just, new? I picked up New World, uh, so I've been playing that for a little bit now. Um, really enjoying it to be honest um it's everything black desert isn't uh no microtransactions the leveling system there is an end goal uh it's like final fantasy 14 met black desert in my opinion because it's mm-hmm. it's really you kind of build your own character and everything's open to you just you pick a weapon you play that weapon i really enjoy it i just hear that uh the mountain's quite uh once you get to the top of the mountain there's really nothing there so once you hit max level, you hit max max level, and that's it. All right, cool. Time to move so, on to the next it, game. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a PvP heavy game, so it seems pretty fun so far. Um, I just beat a visual novel this week. Um, I beat Back for Blood, um, and I've gotten further on the WoW raid in Heroic. So it's been a pretty uh, pretty eventful week actually for video games. How about you, Vic? Yeah, so of course uh, we've been playing uh, Back for Blood. I finally found uh, my group that, as I talked about last week, uh, we just been playing here and there, kind of sporadically. We just got a busy schedule, so sometimes it's hard to um, be able to play every night. So yeah. obviously we just we'll play like two or three levels and just call it a night, just real quick, just because of how much time we that we got. But uh, overall, that game has been fun, and um, I've been playing Far Cry Six. That game has been a lot of fun, and I'm invested in the story. Like I feel like everything I do in that story has an impact and has a reason to it it's not like oh go fetch this and go fetch that like there's like you know what i mean like some ubisoft games have like no meaning to what the fuck you're doing and you're just like oh what this is just a list of bullshit where far cry like i feel like everything i'm doing has a purpose and a meaning to it that was far cry 3 for me like when i started far cry 3 after beating far cry 1 and 2 because i had gotten the collection i in 3 i was just like uh go do this uh that's how you craft now and you're like okay cool and they're like oh go kill some bears that's how bounty targets work have fun you're like okay <laughs> thanks <laughs> right it just didn't feel like some of those games just don't feel like they have uh, like impact to them anymore i've heard six is good though yeah i've been really enjoying six and uh, another game i started actually while at work um in my downtime like for um like lunches and breaks i picked up sable which is like an indie developed game and i just love the art style and it's something different um it's like a like an adventure story driven game so it, it's a lot of fun love the art style i'm looking forward to see where that goes i was kind of hooked from the beginning of it so i was like yo this seems like it has a pretty interesting story so we'll see where that goes so that's what i've been playing of course we've been playing our valorant whenever we can we got had some trouble today but hopefully we'll have better days ahead of us <laughs> i mean it's a sunday afternoon you're gonna get some really bad games some days <laughs> yeah all the sweats are on right now but uh, nonetheless, let's uh, let's get into our gaming topics of this week. We have a decent amount to get into. Uh, we're gonna start off this week with uh, talking about the um, the day before trailer, like the new trailer that was just released. Roger, are you familiar with this game, or is this the first time seeing it? This is the first time I've ever seen it. Uh, what it looks like to me is a pretty a pretty open world zombie game. Um, so we saw in the trailer uh, them customizing a home dealing with some zombies scouting out a city you know kind of quietly going through the city and trying to survive a post-apocalyptic world and honestly i it looks interesting but i'm just worried that it's got that sort of um current uh plague that's hitting the industry where you're like okay here's an open world game and then it's is it gonna have all the content yeah (laughs) is the content gonna actually be there right yeah, so I mean, I remember when this game was announced, I think it was like last year, two years ago, and I saw it, and the best way to describe it, like everyone else, is this is The Division meets Last of Us, basically, with the open world, the city, and trying to scavenge and survive, post-apocalyptic, except that there's zombies in this one, so it, it seems pretty cool, because I love zombie games, and open world games, like this is like a survival game too, so it kind of has like that Valheim, like the new, like the whole survival genre is taking off right now, so um yeah. it'll be pretty cool to see how, how this all plays out because like i want to know it, 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 this is an mmo so i wonder like how many people are in the city at one time and then like is it different every time you lo- load up the game like how does that play out how does it affect the story if there is a story like i don't know how this game's going to play yeah. out but it it's a game that's up and coming and definitely something to look forward to and it's on my radar I, i'm excited to check it out for sure yeah 
and the release date is still unknown, I believe. So, uh, no, sorry. Uh, it says June twenty first. So we're not going to see it in, for six more mo- uh, more than six months, eight months from now. So you know, we've got time to really iron out some of those details. Right. Yeah. Ho- hopefully, over the next couple months, we get some more content. Especially if it's not released until June twenty. 20- 21st we even might see this at e3 like it's like um story reveal trailer or like just a more in-depth video of explaining the game what to expect and stuff like that since like e3 is usually like the first like week of june so that might be a perfect time for them to just plug it in and say hey game's coming out be prepared yeah no exactly so staying in the world of zombie games uh the next game on our list here is dying light hell raid is coming out um vic have you played dying light the first one yeah, I I played and beat the first one. That was a lot of fun. The parkour was something different because it was like heavily focused on the parkour as opposed yeah. to like saying playing Back for Blood or Left for Dead or Call of Duty Zombies. It's not really about the parkour in that go in those games. And I'm excited for Dying Light 2, um Stay Human that comes out next year. Um but this one this is like a DLC, but this was like announced like a year or two or a couple years ago and it's kind of yeah. like its own like standalone game. This is like a mod it looks like. Built it on the dying me of tiny Tina's. It reminds me of essentially Tiny Tina's. We've got a game, and then they've they've now instituted a completely different sort of way to play the game. At this point, it feels like we've gone from oh guns and parkour to magic and undead, and it's like yeah, we're still dealing with zombies, skeletons, stuff like that. But it's really just like it it's something completely different and i guess maybe it's it's suppo- it's it's built with the dying light engine so hopefully we'll still see the parkour but you're a fully armored knight right it, it, it looks like something totally coming out of left field i'm like why are they even wasting time and energy and resources on this when dying light 2 keeps getting like delayed so i would rather them to like cut doing stupid projects like this and focus on their main game because like if they keep being delayed like obviously they're not well, paying enough attention is, doing the right way. This game, this game's over a year old too. So this is an update to an already year old game, and and not only this, they are continuing to work on this game where Steam, thirty nine percent of viewers uh, over all time for this game have voted it, na- it positive. Only thirty nine percent like this game, <laughs> and only fifty five percent of the people like it uh, liked it in the past thirty days. Yeah, so it's a it seems like a pretty terrible game, according to the critics or the community. So I don't know why they're wasting their time or efforts on that. But yeah, um, yeah so we'll we'll see how that plays out. But moving along here, talking about delayed games, um, this one kind of surprised me honestly. But given the whole circumstances with COVID and all that kind of stuff, it's kind of understandable. Uh, Elden Ring was announced that it's being delayed just by a month. Uh, I think its new release date is like February. Uh, what is it? What twenty fifth? February twenty fifth. Yeah. So. That's not terrible. It's not like it's going to push out a few months out or whatever. So Yeah. And uh, let's be honest, it'll be worth it's, it. it's From Software. I've never been disappointed from by From Software. So delaying this game a month, if they need that much time, hell, delay it three months. I'm still going to be happy to get a better polished product from From Software because their games have never disappointed me. They've made me mad. <laughs> But they're Dark Souls. That's that's what you get from a Dark Souls or any of that, uh, any of their games. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I'm super excited. I actually don't think I've ever played any of the Dark Souls games. I think I ha- I own a couple of them, just never played them. Um, but okay. this one, th- this one looks seems pretty interesting. Uh, it, it looks great. Like the the visuals look good. Uh, definitely has a really dark fantasy setting. So it'll be an interesting game to check out. It's definitely one of the most anticipated games to come out, especially in the year of 2022 with a massive lineup that are supposed to be coming out, you know, that we talk about yeah. all the time. But, um, but uh, moving on here from Elden Ring being delayed, uh, Animal Crossing, talking about new DLCs. Uh, new Horizons is uh, is going to be the last DLC that, uh, that Animal Crossing is going to offer, other than small updates like, oh, we've added a new few items, or here's a new themed, uh, a themed release, like they've had Hello Kitty, Mario, things like that. This is the last real update. So this is this is Animal Crossing New Horizons 2.0, and that's it. There's no more major updates after this. So there's no real um, no real idea where Nintendo is going after this because we're looking at Smash. Uh, they're done 
they're done developing Smash or building anything into that. They're done de developing. We haven't seen anything from Mario Kart. Animal Crossing New Horizons now. This is the last major update. What are we going to see? Not sure, but it looks like Animal Crossing's New Horizons is going to be a really well flushed out. Some are even saying it's there's enough content in it to make its own game. So mm -hmm. for a yeah, $24 yeah. DLC. Right. That, that's what I heard, too, that it's basically like a whole standalone game just being added to it. So it's just like, yeah, I mean, if, if there's enough content to be there, then then I have it. But it makes me wonder, like, are they working on the next iteration? Like, is there the next game in the in the series or are they going to be trying something completely different or like i don't I'm, I'm curious like like you said i'm curious what the heck's going on with nintendo because like we haven't heard anything about uh like any new mario games coming out like odyssey 2 we have part we have mario, mario party, party the new mario party coming out for switch but that's about it right and we all knew that 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 should just been a, like an update to the first one but you know that We've already talked about that, but that is, it's really curious to see what Nintendo has in store. Maybe they're just waiting to just go, boom, we got all of this coming out soon. The new 4K Switch is about to drop, the Switch Pro or whatever you want to call it. And that, that could be it because we've talked about it in multiple episodes now that there's a Switch 4K. Uh, it Developers were given a high, like a, a Switch Pro kit, essentially, what we're going to call a Pro Switch at this point, but it's 4K, HDR, things like that. So these developers already have these. So what are they working on? Um, you know, maybe we're going to wait and we're going to see new Switch Pro. And then we're going to see Metroid Prime finally, finally get released after four years of just like, just, just the icon, just Metroid Prime. And then maybe we'll see, you know, a new Mario Kart. Maybe we'll see a new, because Breath of the Wild 2, maybe they'll wait to, mm -hmm. maybe we'll get something like Switch Pro will come out around the time Breath of the Wild 2 is coming out. Right. So. There's a lot in the air. Nintendo's gone pretty dark recently, it seems. Yeah, so definitely something to, to, to follow. And gaming is just only getting bigger right now over the next couple of months, too. So hopefully we see some new news that comes out. But uh, moving on to another big game in the industry, Call of Duty. The uh, the haunting event just went live um, a couple of days ago, I believe. And it's their annual like Halloween theme, bringing like, zombie mode into the war zone and just more like halloween themed events you know um what do you what's your take on it so far like have you hopped in and played or would you hop in and play it at all or too many hackers um, still <laughs> honestly i'd give it a go because like is i'm not i didn't really look too much into it but now people can play as scream or scream is somebody who's chasing people like it looks like it's a new skin and that's that's yeah, about it's a new it skin, but, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm 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 interested to see how they brought uh, the the haunting to Warzone. Right. Yeah. I mean, if it's anything like last year's, last year's was pretty fun. Like when you died it died in Warzone, you would come back as like a zombie, and you would have to like hunt down other soldiers and kill them. But then you can pick up these vials, and if you picked up like two or three of them, I think, then you can like spawn back in. So it was just like a different take to Warzone. It was fun, and it was just like, damn. It only lasted a week or two weeks, however long it is. And you're just like, man, I miss it. And then we have to wait a whole year for something similar to this. But yeah, it looks cool. Call of Duty does really well with their content, like with their crossovers and bringing in like famous franchises into it. And they always play it in really well. Like There's always like a meaning behind everything. Like they yeah. didn't just throw Scream in there because they threw Scream in there. Like there was a meaning for that too. So it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm excited. I might check it out, but only it would only have to be for like Warzone. I'm not trying to hop into multiplayer. <laughs> just because it's trash uh but we do gotta hop into zombies soon uh al keeps hitting me up like yo zombies tonight no bro can't play tonight <laughs> so hopefully we can do that soon and then so moving on to uh the world of computer gaming uh valve is now going through their entire library for pc consoles uh for pc uh pc games uh, the Steam library is being checked for compatibility with the Steam Deck across the entire library is the plan so that we can see if every game runs on it so that it can now be tagged as a Steam uh, Steam Deck game. Right. Yeah, that looks pretty cool because now they have like different icons that are going to tell you like if it's fully compatible or if it's like it, it'll run, but it'll not run that great or it's completely not or it's or if it's unknown, like if it hasn't gotten to the review yet. Um, but that, I mean, it's pretty cool that they're actually taking their time to go through this because it would suck to just go here, here's your steam deck, 
we're not sure where games are going to run on it. <laughs> so my library it, doesn't work. Yeah, that would suck to get in. You're like, well, I can't play none of my games. I just wasted. Yeah, well, then bucks. you also download. You take time downloading the game, installing it, and then trying to run it and have the game just not open. Right. And uh, Disney <laughs> Prince, Princess. Yeah, we're definitely excited. I mean, I know I am to potentially get the Steam Deck because it's just basically a Switch, but having a PC on the go, you know, and having like PC quality yep. games. Where I don't, it's not held back by anything. Where like the Switch can't really play 4K games. The graphics are already not that great handheld, at least unless you dock it. But it's just like the Switch more or less because you can dock this and play well, it on your and computer. And that's the thing. It plays. Uh, it's the idea is to be. Uh, it you can install Windows on it if you want, or you can leave it with the Valve OS. And it's literally people were calling it the Switch Killer. Uh, it is supposed to be the way to play any game since Microsoft's moving most of their library to PC already, it's supposed to be so you can play almost any game from your Steam library on your TV if you don't have your, if you don't have a console or don't want to buy a console. Now you've got this this device you can install games on and play on the go or on a large 55-inch TV that you might have in the basement. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be worth it too. And it's just... It, it looks looks really nice and apparently they already confirmed like game pass is going to work on there too so like that's another another benefit to it because like me and you both have game pass you're just giving me another platform to play game pass on like you imagine if i had this i can legitimately just take that to work and play on that as opposed to the computer at work and trying to stream it over to cloud it, it has its like uh, kind of issues running through that program that's a work in progress i know that but i think running it on like a like a basically handheld console will have next to no issues well you're not you're not playing the game over the internet you're rendering the game in the handheld right in front of you right so i think that's going to be huge because then i just need the internet connection just to play the game if it's online or needs needs an internet connection to to play it um but if it's already on the console like you said it's not having to render in the cloud or stream it whatever i'm doing it's it should just run without any issues with with the high quality too Nothing that looks all blurry and stuff like that when it drops down to like 720p or less. Because those yeah. games can look pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And and the bit rate, once you lose the bit rate, it's over. The game the game's unplayable. So sticking in the world of consoles here, PlayStation 5 announced a new feature, uh, an automatic upload of captures to your phone. So now uh, PlayStation is looking to be able to help move forward with the digital era where everyone's on social media trying to share their newest clip or their, you know, their newest exploit. PS5 now allows you to capture, uh, is planning to allow you to capture and upload things to your phone so that you can just shoot it to whatever digital media or, you know, whatever social media you want to go to. Right. What's your thoughts, Victor? Um... Granted, I like I like this feature, but I feel like Xbox kind of already has this because like whenever I record something or take a screenshot of it on my Xbox, I go right on the Xbox app. It's already on my app, on my phone. I just hit download, save it right to my thing, and I can go edit it right then and there and upload it right to social media. Or I can share it right from that app to social media yeah. without editing. And so it's like it's kind of already there. So I'm curious to see how yeah. PlayStation does this differently. Exactly, because at this point, we're PlayStation's behind behind the curve on this. You know, they're they're only just catching up to what the Xbox One had before the Xbox One and X and S. Mm -hmm. So, so PlayStation yet again is behind the ball, but can they improve upon it? Is my question. So, uh, it's kind of a wait and see right now. I don't think it's out yet, but be on the lookout uh, if you want to share your content from PlayStation Five. Hopefully, you'll be able to do it a lot more nicely now. Jumping over into the world of what Microsoft does best, Xbox Game Pass. Uh, Outriders is coming to Game Pass on PC six months later, I think it is now. Yeah, six months, six later, months yeah. after release. Outriders finally hits PC for Game Pass. This is this is something that people like. I I think this game kind of went under the radar because you didn't want to buy it or when you could play it for free on Xbox, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, why get it on Pass, Steam? Yeah. Yeah, right. why get it on Steam if it's on Xbox Game Pass? But yet, you could only play it on the Xbox first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that had something to do with like their marketing thing with um, Square Enix and uh, uh, I forget who else. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on who the actual developer is with them. But um, I wonder if that was part of the contractual things. Like, hey, it has to be strictly an Xbox exclusive for six months. Kind of like one of those timed exclusive games. And then, hey, yeah. after six months goes by, you can add it to the PC collection, or there may have been a reason like maybe the PC version of the game 
wasn't ready to run on Game Pass because you already know how bad some games run on Game Pass compared to running on Steam. Like it, yeah. it's it's like night and day difference. So maybe there were some issues in regards to that. So, but this is exciting. Um, would would you uh, plan on playing this game now? I've already played and beat it, but would you be down to play it? If somebody asks me today to play Outriders, yeah, sure, I'll play a free game on on Game Pass. Why wouldn't I? If I have it already <laughs> at this point, I've 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 dived fully into it. You know, I got Back for Blood Day One on Xbox Game Pass. I if somebody's like, hey, you got a few days, you want to beat Outriders? Sure, I'd play it. But am I going to go out of my way to play it alone? Probably not. It's at this point, the fad's gone. Most of the people probably have already left the game to move on to something else. Mm-hmm. It, it's no Destiny killer, so. No, <laughs> for sure. And I, the thing is, I, I, I played um, Outriders and I played it solo. I beat it solo and I. It was fun, but this game felt like it was missing something, and I think the missing something was other players because yeah. playing some parts of the game was really difficult because like I couldn't take the aggro off of me because there was no one else to take the aggro off of me. So I'm getting broad, like bro, um, like just completely barraged obliterated. With, oh, yeah, yeah, with barrage with with enemies, and I was just like, this this seems impossible. And like sometimes I would literally have to like alter like, because like. In Outriders, it has like a different difficulty setting. Like you can change the level of the world up or down. Like once you level it up, you can also go change it back down if it gets to be too difficult for you. And that would affect like what loot you would get, what X, how much XP you get, and stuff like that. So it had its rhyme and reason and like its benefits for trying to go out to the max level. But sometimes I'm like, yo, this shit's too hard. I can't beat it. I died 36 times. <laughs> I got to bring it back because I'm tired of dying. So I have to bring yeah. it back one notch and then I'm good. But like I feel like if I have teammates, it's a lot easier to play. Yeah, Way easier. and I, I assume everyone has their own specialized kit. I really didn't look into this mm-hmm. game much because it wasn't on PC without paying for it. And it was like, I don't want to buy a game right now. That yeah. This game just doesn't look good. It looks like a Destiny game. Mm-hmm. And I don't have friends who want to play it on PC. So with it being on Game Pass, maybe. But uh, right. staying in the world of Game Pass here, turns out Microsoft is actually disappointed with the performance of Game Pass. They projected a 48% increase from last year's game pass they only got 37 percent growth what's your thoughts vic i think that they uh held the held the bar too high and i think this is typical corporate america was like oh we we set a high expectation they never reached it so we're disappointed like 37 percent is still a hell of an increase and the fact that people still can't get the new systems yet should should play into that number like maybe people aren't invested into getting an xbox yet because they don't have one and they can't get a new one. They don't want to waste money on the Xbox One. So like they're waiting because they want to get in the Game Pass, but they want a Series S or Series X, and they want to be able to play that route. Not everyone has a PC, so maybe they don't want to do Game Pass for PC. So that they don't, they don't, there's no way of playing it. So they might have a PS4 right now, and they were like, nah, maybe it's maybe it's time to switch to an Xbox, but I want to wait until the, I would get the new one. So maybe that's part of the reason too. And I think the only time will tell between now and next year when they release the numbers again to see how much it does increase because hopefully between then consoles you know, will be more hopefully easily we're not ex- getting a shrink right hopefully they don't shrink and that's the thing i agree there are a lot of people out there who don't have the console because they can't get one it's the same way thing with playstation and i bet that plays a lot into it because some people like myself if i can't get the ps5 i'm not going to play playstation games that are new and up and coming because i can play them on pc better <laughs> right so yeah, that makes sense and, and so you know, sticking here with the Xbox information, uh, X, uh, Microsoft's still looking to buy more studios. They want to increase their repertoire, uh, their 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 listings for Game Pass. So, you know, what are you thinking, Vic? Who do you, who's next? Who's on the chopping block for Microsoft to buy? Um, I know this was a rumor a while ago, and I'm, I'm thinking it, it still is a possibility, but Sega, because they're trying to grow into that Japanese market that ate that Western culture, that Western market out there or Eastern um, market. And it's just like by acquiring Sega or even Capcom would, would be huge. That would add so much more content to game pass. It would, it would draw more attention from that market to be like, yo, not only do I get all of my games that I'm usually used to that are, that I love to play, but they have all these other new 27 other titles or companies working on games that, are, that look really good too. So I think it's just going to build to it. And I think it, it's worth it, in my opinion. What about you? Uh, honestly, I don't know any studios that would probably be what they'd want to buy. But mentioning that, yeah, I agree. Sega or Capcom. And for a while there, 
Microsoft was the only one publishing some Sega and Capcom games, like Sonic. Only the Sonic games were coming to Xbox for a while there, and it's like that. It seems like a partnership at that point, you know. If Sega's only outlet is to sell to Microsoft, then maybe we might see them finally say, "Hey, we'll sell ourselves," because we know Sega is on the downward slope. They've had to close their arcades in Japan now because mm -hmm. they're just not making the money they used to be. Like the last, uh, I think one of the last Sega arcades closed in in uh, Tokyo last year or this year and right. that pandemic has a little bit to play into that but it's still sega sega had to close down so who knows maybe we'll see them buy an eastern studio and if they do that definitely will help them expand into the eastern markets um but i don't know if capcom or sega is really the way to go for some of that it mm -hmm. would give them it would allow them to move into territories like sonic and stuff and maybe reinvigorate the series but only time will tell with that. Uh, I don't think we're going to see any more purchases this year out of Microsoft. It'll probably won't happen yeah. until. And actually, yeah, just one more thing though. Why I think Sega would be it is because of like how much they are pushing um the the Yakuza franchise. Like basically every game from the Yakuza franchise is on Game Pass now, and um with with um Light, Life uh, was it like a Dragon, um exclusively released on Xbox as a timed exclusive for the first six months to yeah. a year or whatever it was so they, they're already building that connection and, and that reason and like that partnership that they already have and, and the yakuza franchise is actually um published by sega so i think that, that that's also another another idea another hint like hey we already got this partnership how about you come on board we'll help fund stuff we'll help you put out to get reach more people more audiences because honestly i never even heard of the yakuza franchise uh, personally until xbox started to be like yo it's on Game Pass. Check these games out. These are awesome. And I, the whole gaming world blew up. They're like, yo, these games are great. And I was like, yo, these games have been out for like ever. I never even knew about them. They were a PlayStation 4 game for a lot of them. PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. And honestly, I, I only found them because I had a PS4. When I bought a PS4, I was looking for other games to play. And I found the Yakuza series. And I I got I got the, the remaster of one. And then I bought Zero. And I was like, these games are awesome. Mm -hmm. They may not have the best combat. But, but they're, they're fun, right? They're like, they're goofy, like they're weird, like they're out there, but they're a lot of fun. I played yeah. the I've been playing the zero like zero for a little bit, like when it um when I first came to Game Pass, and I haven't went back to it yet, just because that's going to take a long time to beat. Because it is there's a lot of content to get through in these games, so it's just like, do I want to invest eighty to hundred dollars into this game? Probably not right now. <laughs> yeah, and so um, sticking here along the lines of Xbox and Game Pass, uh, and events and maybe even announcements xbox 20 20th anniversary event was just announced it's november 15th at 1 p.m est what you think you're gonna see vic okay yeah so basically they uh came out and said that there's no new announcements here at this event which kind of shocked me because i feel like this may have been time to make a big announcement like hey it's our 20th anniversary we got these new stuff coming out next year or whatever, whatever the time frame may be. But I think we're going to see more in-depth look at Starfield. I think this might be a time to showcase more of that game. Um, and, of course, I think we're going to see Hellblade 2 because it's been quiet ever since it was announced at uh, the Game Awards in 2019, I think it was, when it was announced. So it, it, it's been a while since we've seen Hellblade 2. So, and they have so much more up their sleeve to just be like... <laughs> We got all these games. Go, they're coming out soon next year, whatever it is. So they got a lot of content to go with. But I mean, maybe maybe they do announce an ac acquisition at um at at the, at the at this event. But what, what's your thoughts? You got anything that they might do or honestly, showcase? Honestly, I I'm I'm gonna agree with you 100. percent At this point, we're not probably gonna see any any new announcements, but we're definitely gonna see. All right, we gotta hype up the 2022 roster. Let's go. Let's do it. And. I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see Starfield. We're going to see definitely Hellblade 2. We're going to see... Uh, maybe we'll see some stuff along the lines of uh, new changes to Game Pass next year. Um, maybe they'll update their list. Um, but honestly... Ooh, actually, I, I just thought of something that we have not seen in a while from Xbox. Is Xbox has always been big on their backwards compatibility list. And basically, not every original Xbox game and not every 360 game is playable on Xbox One or the Series X and S right now. What if they announce like a large lump sum of games that they'll be like, yo, our entire backlog of every game on the Xbox or 360 is now playable on your Series X and S? 
or or part of Game Pass. You imagine like that that would throw that would throw Game Pass through the roof instantly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would it would basically sh- shun or whatever whatever word I'm trying to use here properly. What Nintendo just did with their expansion pass pack yeah. and they're bringing back their classic retro games to their to their systems. Xbox goes, hold my beer. You can have all of them, not, games, not just honestly, nine of them. Yeah. <laughs> that that's doable that 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 seems like that seems like the winning thing to do for a 20th anniversary you know they're looking back they're saying we've hit our 20th year mark now look where we came from all on game pass yeah that'd be incredible and I, and, and maybe that's the way to grow themselves from the 30 37 percent growth to the 48 that they were looking for you know we might pick the people up that we're missing because that's definitely something that i think nintendo has a shortfall on they're like oh you have to buy a 50 dollars yearly ex- subscription now to get these things like nintendo has always been cheaper than mm-hmm. microsoft for their online presence but the catalog is nowhere near as, as extensive you know right. paying 50 dollars a year for like less than 50 games right and i also think that's why they're the 37 percent was the number not 48 is because i think in the first half of last year there wasn't really anything big on Game Pass, you know? Like, it was cool when they, when they came out with the, the uh, MLB The Show. That was a shocker. And then adding Outer Worlds Day 1 to, to, the, to that. But Microsoft, it, like, exclusive games didn't really have anything yet. Microsoft Flight Simulator was, like, the first one. And then, like, Psychonauts yeah. 2. Like, they're starting to roll out now. But they, well, yeah. there was nothing there in the first. And I think I think the thing we have to take for granted here is COVID really showed us that like day one streaming exclusives. If you've got a subscription, let's just roll into it because it's guaranteed money. Yeah, we get sixty dollars every month or two from some people, but now we've got fifteen dollars guaranteed if we day one ex- day one release it. Like Black for Blood, the fact that that came out day one on Game Pass was huge. Mm-hmm. That was unreal like why buy it any other way if it's on game pass like yeah i gotta keep a subscription but now i've paid 15 dollars, and that's that's one right. game it's, like, it's if pretty I funny back blood if i played back for blood for an entire month and just that on game pass i've made my 15 dollars easy mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah that I doesn't include it. anything else that you dive into yeah and i don't own it but you know you're also going to get expansion packs and dlc and stuff that's always mm-hmm. included in game pass right like we, the we, juggernaut edition is included i believe inside game pass right and, for, and, for uh, other games like right um state of decay 2 yeah state of decay 2 they had that's what i was trying to think of the name <laughs> they have juggernaut edition i think on game pass so you get all the dlc yeah just like Destiny. So, oh, the heartland came out and you got it day one on game pass mm-hmm. and destiny destiny 2 is the same way all their dlcs are on game pass and then when the Witch Queen comes out in February, it's going to be on Game Pass. Like it's a no-brainer, honestly. And I think that's going to be a count to why that number was as low as it was. And I think once they start rolling out all the all of their first-party exclusives, it's going to make people want to come onto that platform. Especially once like Halo's almost here, Starfield comes out next year, um, Elder Scrolls Six, whenever that drops, that's going to be bananas because I already know that's going to be an Xbox exclusive. It, it only makes sense. Well, it'll be on PC too. Well, yeah, Microsoft exclusive, better. <laughs> yes, that's that's the way I would look at it at this point. But, but uh, um, staying along the lines here of things, uh, things related to Microsoft and and the world of Xbox, Splinter Cell. You know, that's a game that I remember a lot of playing on on my Xbox, on my mm-hmm. Xbox 360. Splinter Cell just announced. A new game. A new game is in development. You've been calling this for a while now, Vic. Are you Are you excited? Are you really through the moon finally? Yeah, because honestly, I I missed out on all of the Splinter Cell games, and and it's because like that was during a time where I wasn't big into story driven games, and I was younger. It just wasn't there. Like my mindset wasn't there to play them kind of games. The last Tom Clancy uh, Splinter Cell game that we got was in 2013 with Blacklist. That was eight years ago. And if this game is just rumored to be in development, this game may not come out until 2022, 2023. So that could be a 10-year difference between games. Granted, we, we've been getting some drops of Sam Fisher and other Tom Clancy games, which is just throwing that community, just like, what are you doing with a beloved character? Like, you're ruining them. Like, you're ruining um, Splinter Cell and Sam Fisher. Like, it doesn't make sense for what they did. But yeah, this is super exciting, because this may be the time where they reboot the franchise, they introduce this character to a community who's never played, splinter cell 
and this might be the time for even me to hop in. Like, yo, this game's dope, and make and what 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 if um th- what if this is a way for Microsoft too to m- build that connection again? Because I do remember them having a connection with um Splinter Cell. Is hey, Splinter Cell is going to come out on Game Pass day one, but if you've never played Splinter Cell before, before it comes out, all of the old games are on Game Pass. Because I already talked about it before. If they bring their entire back catalog, that means all the old games are going to be on there. But what's your thoughts? Is Are you excited for a new Splinter Cell game? I really like the sort of stealth assassination games, and I haven't gotten to play one in quite some time. But I did get to play a Splinter Cell game. I think the one I played was Conviction. I got to play Splinter Cell Conviction for a while there, and that was that was fun. Like I, I thoroughly liked the the Splinter Cell series when I got to play it, uh, and I'm kind of happy to see this come back. It it was something that like when I played Metal Gear, for example, it's this you know the new Metal Gear game that came out a few years back, like what five I've, six years now. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when I played that, I was really excited to play a game where I run around stealth and assassinated people and stuff like this, but this is like the, one of the original true stealth games out there. Like mm-hmm. this is what Assassin's Creed built itself off of. Basically. So, and but that that's also my concern though with this game is that if this is in the works, we all know the curse that Ubisoft has right now. I don't want this to be an open world Ubi- um Splinter Cell game. I need this to be more linear driven, more like classic level based like game. Yeah. And I'm not talking about level like leveling up your character. I'm talking about like individual levels that you play through and beat, but give you yeah give you different ways to beat each level, but don't make it a massive open world game. And I got to go do this. Got to go do this. Let me go collect this. Let me go help this person. Like, I don't got yeah. time for that. That's not Splinter Cell. I don't need exactly. it. So I, hopefully like, they do this right. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of disappointed where Ubisoft is. And I agree. If, if it's anything like Ubisoft is Ubisoft, I'm worried that, yeah, they're going to be like, Oh, go, you know, go deal with this guy over here. Go assassinate this target halfway across the map. And then you're like, okay, go over here. It's always been Splinter Cells. You're always kind of working towards a critical, there's like a critical thing going on. Time is of the important, in of the importance. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to go do play this game of uh, cards over here. Or I'm going to go into a cockfighting ring. Or it's like, you know, it, like it's cool in Fa- uh, Far Cry. That's kind of what they built the series off of at that point. Yeah. But like, or splinter cell i'm hoping it's it's a story game i want to like go in through the level and have to beat it three different ways you know go loud go quiet yeah. or a little bit of mix of a both you know right kind of like hitman was hitman 3 came out um um beginning of the year in january and that is already it's still in talks for game of the year because how good it was it was a stealth game assassination game that's what hitman is all about and it wasn't like an open world game it was just like yo you can you gotta assassinate this target but you assassinate this target. You find your way on how you want to do this. We'll give you all the tools and different options and ways to do it. But you get to choose on how you're going to do this. Or if you get caught, you fail. Or whatever it is. Like you're going to get overran. You're going to die if you if you don't do it. Pull off the stealth. So I think this would be pretty cool to see a Tom Clancy classic stealth game. Because Assassin's Creed was supposed to be that assassination stealth game. But the last three Assassin- Assassin's Creed games aren't classic Assassin's Creed games. They weren't really about running. stealth. They're running they're, and beat people's heads off. Right. Let me let me just button mash as much as I can to get through the level or clear out the, the outpost or whatever it is. Like, that's not fun. Like, yeah. I miss the old Assassin's like, Creed games. Playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla, like, the idea to me seems really weird because, like, Vikings care about, like, traditional Viking, uh, what we know about the Vikings. They cared about honor and fighting in combat, but going around murdering people behind their back, that sends you straight to hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, well, that Hollow was a pretty interesting concept because, like, you you play as the Vikings, one of the main characters from the Viking crew, but you're not part of the assassins, um, like order. Do, do you play a lot? Like, there's two assassins that you meet that don't they don't call themselves assassins yet because the assassin order was never created. Um, but they're just like the chosen ones, I think is what they're called in that, and they are like true assassins. Like, they mark their targets, they know how to do it. The, they they teach you the leap of fate. They give you your your hidden blade because that returns. Uh, finally, after not being there for the last two games, um, so it was really cool to see that. And then like you you yourself kind of get inducted into this assassination role where you know go eliminate this target go assassinate this target and you can literally just assassinate them like quietly and or you can go in there guns blazing well not guns but you know what i mean but 
So it was it kind of went back to its roots, but in a very different way. But that's why Valhalla was super successful because they kind of went back to their old ways, but modernized it enough where they they kind of grew with the franchise. I think. But yeah. we'll see where that that franchise goes. That's another story for another day. Yeah. So, um, kind of here to shift gears a little bit. We've got a you know a varying degree of different topics here to round it out in the end. <laughs> uh, going back to the world of Nintendo, uh, kind of a weird thing yeah. from Pokemon. Uh, a new announcement was made for Arceus, we believe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the weird thing is, like Arceus is supposed to be like feudal Japan, but they had like this found footage recording of somebody like finding a Pokemon. It was like Blair Witch meets Pokemon, and it was really <laughs> it was crazy. creepy. <laughs> oh, it was creepy as hell. But they released this video uh, where a Pokemon researcher, I guess, is trying to find this rare Pokemon that he sees and then, like, gets all, you know, gets attacked by Pokemon or whatever. But it's it came out of nowhere, and it was, like, a found footage. So, right. Well, um, the idea behind it, too, is, like, you're you're in the month of October. It's, like, haunted, yeah. it's creepy, it's spooky season, yeah. you know. So they kind of kind of went down that whole theme and trying to make... Because this a poke like Pokemon uh, Legends of Arceus is going to be a different take on the franchise. It it looks kind of crazy, like Dark Souls, like almost like the Pokemon actually can attack you, and not just your Pokemon too. So like that's going to be different. So maybe it does have like a dark tone in some in some instances. So we'll see. Because yeah. I mean, think about it. Um, the original, the OG one, and we went into that like graveyard tower or like haunted building, and all the ghost Pokemon were in there, and it, that was creepy. Like when you were reading the different the lore around the, that mat or that that building and stuff like that, like that was creepy. Like if that was like a three D real game, that that would be that would have been a creepy ass level. Lavender Town, Lavender Town has always been one of those things in the Pokemon community where people have always been like, you know, that was creepy as fuck. I loved it. Like you know, it, it gave you <laughs> it, they they kind of rounded the edge out between Cubone and 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 and. and like the darkness behind some of the actual Pokemon concepts, like mm-hmm. Cubone wears the skull of its mother and mm-hmm. uses her a bone from her body to beat people to death with. Like that's actually the Pokemon's lore. Like Haunter, Haunter, Gengar, and Ghastly, they try to steal your soul. They literally try to steal your soul. So like, I think it's interesting that Pokemon's always had this dark backstory, but it's always been like this upbeat, fun game. Mm-hmm. So I, it was it's because it was like a kids video. game. It was like a kids yeah. franchise. So like they couldn't go too far dark well they they i guess their audience became kids whether or not they wanted them to be kids they were like oh maybe we've (laughs) gotta make it more fun for kids (laughs) family friendly moving on here uh an interesting development in the world of pc we're getting god of war on pc after i just bought it for ps4 we're getting god of war on pc what's your thoughts there vic imagine the timing right for you <laughs> yeah yeah th- th- this was actually in- interesting because like i already told you i have it on ps4 but maybe i can play it on my pc because maybe my pc will be able to run it and look better than my ps4 because i have the, the og ps4 i don't have the slim or the pro ps4 so maybe this is my chance to play it before i can go get a ps5 because one we already know it's not available but two i'm not ready to spend the money on it because i don't really play playstation i'm not ready to drop 500 for two games or three games you know I'm not ready for that yet so we'll see. plus the cost of the game yeah so it's just like nah, god of war on pc yeah. might might be uh, up my alley i think it's funny because the community's like oh day one god of war released on pc day two modding community hits <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty funny I can, I can imagine around. it. Yeah, people were joking around. They're gonna uh, somebody photoshopped uh, um, Yoda into uh, Kratos, and then uh, and then Baby Yoda as the boy. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Are they gonna put Thomas really the Tank Engine you. in it? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, you're hunting the the deer in the first level, and all of a sudden, it's now Thomas the Tank Engine instead. <laughs> that would be awful. <laughs> that would be so awful. Uh, but no, I think it's really interesting to see that PlayStation's now adopting the 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 viewpoint. Sony's like, well, I guess maybe we should put some of our exclusives on PC now. Just not right away. Just I, not right away. I think that's going to be their motto. I think, or not motto, like their their idea behind it is, we're going to release day this on one. PlayStation day one on PlayStation. But a year to three years down the road, we're going to we're, we're almost four. Yeah, we're going to we're going to give this game to the to the audience who maybe not never wants to buy a playstation a chance to play playstation exclusive games you're just gonna have to wait three years yeah. like and, and that's gonna make you wonder like 
do I buy a PlayStation so I can play it day one, or am I cool on waiting three to four years to play a game? Like, I'll be honest, I'm playing God of War right now on PlayStation 4, and the game looks fucking gorgeous. It really does. Like, it stands the test of time lately. Like, it is an awesome-looking game, and I've been super happy with it. So, waiting three years doesn't seem bad. Right. You know, you still yeah, get to play it if you don't want a console. On, on my PS4, I played through uh, Horizon Forbidden West, or... Horizon Zero Dawn. Zero Dawn, Jesus, thanks. Thing about their new one. But yeah, that game looks phenomenal on the PS4, and I was playing it on like a crappy TV too at, at that time, on a 32-inch yeah. Kobe that I got sitting here next to me that I don't use anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it, yeah, it, it, the games still look and run great on previous gen, it's just newer games aren't going to be able to run on those systems. Yeah. So, um, moving on here to next gen uh, and games coming, games being re-released. Essentially, uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven and Witcher three are getting a next gen port, but they've been delayed until twenty twenty two. They were supposed to be out this year, I believe, but now they're being delayed till next year. You know, it feels like par for the course to me. You know, <laughs> I'm at this point, you can't disappoint me, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. I. Like I'm, I'm over here on PC, and I'm still like, the game looks good. Like I upgraded my CPU at one point because that was my bottleneck for a lot of the game, and it looks great now. But like the fact that people on console can, still can't play it on next gen. This game was supposed to be beautiful and like breathtaking, but like it's really not that great on next gen yet. So the update for next gen for Cyberpunk 2077 isn't coming out till next year, and The Witcher 3 re-release for next gen isn't out till next year. Right, yeah, and I think Cyberpunk is aimed for early next year, and I think Witcher 3 is aimed for, like, holiday season of 2022, which is interesting because, like, Witcher 3 came out before Cyberpunk, but I guess they want to try and satisfy the Cyberpunk uh, issues, drought that they're in right now. Maybe they they can win a lot of people back with the next-gen version of it because maybe it'll run how the game was intended to run because, honestly, that's what I think it is. is like Cyberpunk was designed for next-gen and, like, basically next-gen only. In PC, obviously, but when they came out on old consoles and it just flopped it tremendously on those, so I think that might have been the issue. So hopefully, we we get a good game when it comes out. Go ahead and delay it because it's been delayed four times on on the initial release. If it gets delayed again, I don't care. Just make sure it works and make yeah. make sure it's good because I'm ready yeah, to play it on next gen because I bought it to play it on my next gen console and never got to experience it on how it's supposed to look. Yeah, so. We'll see what we we'll see what we get at this point. Uh, I hope for the best, but at this point, you know, if they left Sleeping Dogs lie, I'd be fine too. Because most people are already disappointed, and are they really going to get that much of a turnaround for people to come back after they've wronged them so badly? Like the PlayStation <laughs> launch was horrible. So right, exactly. So it's only a wait and see, though. But our last two topics here, um, we got Europa Universal. What is it? For Universal. Sales. Yeah, Universal. Uh, for Origin Origins DLC was announced. What's your thoughts on this? I know you're you're into these kind of games. So, uh, Europa Four, um, and Hearts of Iron both got a new are both are getting a new update. And honestly, to me, uh, like I really included this today on our topic was because this is what a true developer in my mind should be. Paradox Interactive is one of those developers who like they make a game. The community says, I don't like this. I don't like this. Can you expand upon the game? They build. So when you get a DLC, the game doesn't feel like you're like, oh, we've just added this side story here. Like with DLCs with sto- like some of these games out there, it feels like we've added a mission where you go kill three dragons over here and they're legendary dragons and they give you these super special armor. And it's like, well, I've beaten the game. Why do I need the super special armor? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Go do it for fun. Paradox is like, well, we've rewritten the game. We do it for free, and we also release paid uh, paid DLC. With this DLC for EU4, they are taking a look at the African nation and a, and a way to play the African nations in a more uh, unified manner so that you can fight against, uh, fight against the people in in Europe before colonialization and things like that. So it, it changes the way to play the game because these games are historical simulators. They allow you to rewrite how the simulation of history goes. Mm-hmm. So I think it's really cool that they continue to put this labor and labor of love into these games. And we're about to get a new one here next year um, where we're going to get um, 
Victoria, Victoria right. 3 comes out next mm-hmm. year. And honestly, if you're going to play a strategy game, pick up a Paradox game. You won't be disappointed. Yeah, you got to pay for DLC every maybe year or every six months if you want a full, like an even more fleshed out game. But it's always fun, even with the DLC you have. So I think it's really neat. And Hearts of Iron 4 now is really focusing on the ability to play any nation during World War II in the world. They've they've kind of now finally flushed out ideas and, and sort of technology and sort of uh, national ethos for every country that exists. Historical events that happen for them. They're really trying to put the labor of love into the game because previously it was like you played America, uh, Italy, Russia, China, Japan, or one of the big power players during World War II. And that was it. Like, if you want to play Greece, nothing really happened. They didn't have their own unique events. They didn't have their own unique story. Like, there wasn't a really way to play Greece other than just mm-hmm. sitting there. And so, you know, this to me is what a developer should be. You release a game, and if you're going to make the game as a service or try to give us a bunch of DLC, make the DLC matter. Continue the story. Don't just leave us where we are or try to do a side story. Like, very few can do a side story and make it work. Like, Borderlands, for example. Right. Yeah, Borderlands you know, was always good with their DLCs. You know, their DLCs felt impactful, and they felt like they took the story, they took the the challenge and upped it. They turned it to a ten, and it and it felt like I wasn't just going to do some random thing. They were like, "Here, we threw this together. Play it." <laughs> well, that that sounds like with um, unfortunately with um, Fe- uh, Immortals: Phoenix Rising. Like as much as I hyped that game up, the DLCs is where it was a lackluster because it would just felt like they just added stuff one that just had no meaning to. So the game, like I went through, I Wasn't saved all the guys. I've never played any of them. I just know the reviews and like it, watching well, the content from and, it. And what I'm saying is, they they build these DLCs for people who are just starting the game, not somebody who's already played the game. Because if you already played the game, half the time you go back to these DLCs, and there's nothing to be garnered at at max level or end game. You're you go through these DLCs and you're like, well, I'm just gonna crush everything I'm looking at because <laughs> I've gone into DLCs and they're like the enemies are made to be level 15. And you're like level 30. And you're like. Why am I playing this DLC now? Oh, we built this DLC for level 15 characters. You got to start over or have a level 15 character really, truly experience it. And it's like, why did I play this? Right. Yeah, so it is definitely weird for that. But th- this is exciting, though, to see these two games that are pretty big, um, that are coming out with, like, meaningful and actually, like, good updates, good good DLC as well. So, I mean, that's, that's exciting. And, and I know both you and a, a lot of the guys in our community play strategy games, too. So this is this is good. This is good for sure. But um, yeah, man, that's all of our gaming topics that we got this week. But we do got to let's dive into our deep freeze moment of the week. Um, we we'll start off here with um, the question, which Call of Duty has the overall best map like map group? And then we're going to choose our top three Call of Duty multiplayer maps and zombie maps. So I'm going to start with you, Roger. Which, which Call of Duty game had its best collection of maps? I know you, you fall, you've fallen out of Call of Duty. Like the, you know, uh, for me, for... The the small amount, the five or six years I played Call of Duty, Modern Warfare really was the best Call of Duty in my mind for me. That was when I had the most fun. That was when I, you know, I I, I literally sat in school going, man, I really want to go home and play Call of Duty. I really <laughs> want to play Call of Duty. Why am I not playing Call of Duty? I played anything but Call of Duty, and I was like, why am I even playing this? I want to go back to Call of Duty. Modern Warfare was that game for me, and honestly, I liked I liked it a lot. Like I. Nuketown was one of my favorite maps because that was a modern warfare, uh, uh, right? Wasn't it? Or Black was Ops. that? Was it Black Ops? Because yeah. I thought Nuketown came. We had one, and then they re-released it. Yeah, Nuketown was always re-released, but it was always re-released in Black Ops maps. Okay, because then that for me would be Black Ops was. Uh, Black Ops really came after Modern Warfare, the first Modern Warfare, right? Yeah. So it was COD Four, which was Modern Warfare, World at War, Modern Warfare Two, Black Ops One. Modern yeah. Warfare 3, and then Black Ops 2, which is yeah. trash. So, yeah, I, I had fun on the first Black Ops for a little bit there, uh, and I had a lot of fun with Modern Warfare 1 and 2. And was Rust? Rust, yeah. I think, was. Rust, Rust was, was Modern Warfare 2, one. yeah. That was always one of my favorites, and it was one of the biggest memes to me, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one, so, so, one me, Rust. So w- w- which entry is like do you think had the best collection of maps then that you enjoyed the most? Honestly, I remember most of the maps, uh, the ones I remember from Modern Warfare, but there are a few out there that every so often I remember, and I'm like, yeah, I like those maps. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't remember anything from World of War. I don't remember a single map from World of War. Yeah, I know I know a couple of them, but not, yeah, like you're saying, it wasn't 
wasn't too much. Yeah, we we played World of War for zombies because that was the introduction of zombies, for sure. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, I I don't remember a single one from that. I <laughs> honestly I remember the map and I can't even remember the name of it. Uh, you know, like I know there is one map uh where we played in essentially an airplane graveyard. I can't remember the name oh, yeah. of the map. I don't know the I don't know it either. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can picture because um the zombie map Noc- Nocturne Toten is actually in that map. It's like one of the main buildings in the middle middle of the map yeah and (laughs) so like i can never remember the names of them but i can remember the maps themselves like i remember there was one map in world uh and modern warfare i think it was and we played inside of essentially a a metalworking factory and i can't even remember that one anymore but um yeah so my uh my my overall franchise like that had the best collection of maps probably was modern warfare 2 just because like it was that like this was a hard choice for me because Modern Warfare Two, Modern Warfare Three are like my most beloved Call of Duty games. That's the one I've spent the most time with, um, and the ones that I was probably the best at personally. But Modern Warfare Two is like map list was insane. Like you had Afghan, you had Derail, you had Estate, Favela, um, High Rise, which was a fun ass map, um, Invasion, Karachi, Quarry, Rundown, Rust, Terminal. Scrapyard, uh, Skid Row, Subbase, yeah, Terminal. Underpass. Terminal was one of my favorites. Like, Wasteland. I remember Terminal. <laughs> right, like these maps were so great. Like I remember like playing them and it was just like, oh, I'm going to get a nuke on this map. I know exactly how to do it. Like cuz like once you got your Harrier, yeah. it was like over. Harrier, I'm chocolate looking, gun. Nuke. I'm looking at the maps and I'm like, "Oh my god. I forgot the names, but like I can't Yeah, Modern Warfare 2 would probably be the one that I would probably say more, more so. That's one I really played a lot of online game against. Like Vacant. I remember playing Vacant. That was on so much. I loved that was COD 4. Uh, it was yeah. brought back on to uh, it was as a DLC. In the Modern Warfare 2, yes. That's what I would get at. Like, Vacant, it got a lot more lighted. And it, I loved that. I, there's just... Yeah, no, I agree. Modern Warfare, the series, I would say Modern Warfare 1, 2, and 3 were awesome to me. Mm-hmm. They they had some great maps. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely would say that for sure. But um, So what, what, what start off here. What are your top three multiplayer maps across all of them? I know you probably have to do some research right now. All right, let me look here. I love <laughs> Terminal. Terminal will probably be one of my most favorites. Um, I wouldn't say Rust is a top three, but it's definitely one of those maps that I just enjoyed people. Like, if you played a, you played like 10 or 20 people on that map mm-hmm. versus 10 or 20 people, and you're like, well, this is just silly. You spawn, die, spawn, die. And it got, <laughs> like, it, it wasn't aggravating. Like, I, I remember complaining so much in Call of Duty whenever somebody killed me. But, like, Underpass, that was one of my favorite maps. I remember playing that for hours and hours and hours. Um, I would say, if I had to pick, Underpass was probably one of my favorites. Um, Skid Row was probably one of my favorites. And... I would have to go with probably Terminal. Terminal or Crash? Yeah, Crash was in COD 4, another great one that was brought over to multiple entries in that franchise. Yep. What about about you, Vic? Yeah, so I I would say like my my number one for sure, I'm just going to start off the top, uh, is Terminal. Terminal was just like one of those, like when it popped up, it was either Terminal or another map. It was 100% Terminal. Like there was no choosing any other map. It was the map to go to because it was balanced. It had indoor combat. It had outdoor combat. It had a nice sight lines for snipers. It just had like nice flow points. Open even for room. it had open rooms. It had cover. It had everything you needed. Like if you were playing in like I remember when you're in the ticket lines on the back right hand of the map. Like it's all open, but there's cover. Right. It was just. It just was balanced everything just worked and there was counter to everything like there was multiple routes to get to different places and, yeah like in and there were you know big open lanes but even though you're in this big open lane there's like four doors and four <laughs> different choke points to fight inside of while you're fighting the lane right so yeah terminal was overall one of my my f- most favorite map um but uh, other ones that really like stuck out to me um, probably was um, Hard Hat for Modern Warfare 3. That was just a lot of fun on that map. A lot of chaos, especially playing like Domination. Trying to hold that B point was insane because like the, the routes to get to it from A or C were, and then like, the middle route to get to B as well was just insane. Like, oh, here comes a grenade. Oh, here comes a Predator missile. It was insane. And that map was just like a lot of fun though. I do remember Hard Hat. <laughs> <laughs> and when I mentioned what I was naming off the list of Modern Warfare 2, like this one was tough for me to choose between the two between favela and high rise 
high rise was a lot of fun and i love the quote unquote like easter egg to find in that game because like you could run off jump off the ledge grab onto the the, the slanted like um like elevator thing that people would use to clean windows and stuff you would go up that go around the edge of the the building climb up on that one climb up on the roof and then you could be up there seeing an entire map from up there or like going out on the crane and then going to the edge and just use your sniper like there were so many different unique things about high rise and playing capture the flag on that map was so much fun so yeah i would pick probably high rise over favela but i love favela because of the verticality of that map and like the super close quarters of running through the favela was insane or like jumping from rooftop to rooftop or like running uphill versus running downhill or like that open lanes on the outside of the map on the two sides going up the hills man that map was insane but it was not good for kill streaks because they would not work. You you could just go hide in buildings all damn time, the whole time. Yeah, the whole <laughs> game was in buildings. Right. Yeah. So those th- those would definitely be my three with a honorable mention with favela for sure. But um, what are your top three zombie maps? There's I know there's a long list of these and a lot of ones that we played on for many many um, years. So to be honest here, I really think that the new zombie maps are a good com- a competitor like. Cold War has some really good maps. Like honestly, I I really like the way they played out now, and especially with the fact that they're completable. Like you can actually go through and try and complete the story. Mm-hmm. But like if I'm going like classic here, Darice, that mm-hmm. was one of my favorites. I can't tell that you was... how many hours we spent on that. <laughs> so many hours <laughs> sitting up on the fucking balcony or whatever, just trying to get kill after kill after kill to see how far we could go like varukt really kind of showed where the game is going to go after we got like knocked down code and it was like uh it was cool you know we got varukt we're in an insane asylum and it it gets it gets really creepy and really fast paced and it says okay we're gonna really continue to build this game but like for me I think Varukt wasn't one of my favorites, but it really was a crucial map to show us where the COD series is going with zombies, that they really care and they want to keep building them. But like Doris was one of my favorites. Um, the new ones are awesome. I There's just so many good ones to pick from. Mm-hmm. And then there are so many I just don't even remember at this point, to be honest, that just <laughs> right. don't feel great. Right. For sure. So, so what about you, Nick? Yeah, so my my three, no no particular order with these ones. Because I love all of these zombie maps equally that I'm about to name. But Shino Numa from the original World at War um, was a lot of fun. That was the introduction of like um, uh, the, the Wonder Waffy DG2. Um, that was a lot of fun just getting that gun and then having like a, a nice AR or light machine gun. And I could play that solo. I got to like 70 solo because like running a certain path. And um, the one area of the map, once you had that set up and all four perks, like you were good to go. But it was fun when that map came first came out. And we were playing it because we stayed up all night for the DLC. Boom, comes out. And we're trying to hold it because we were trying to play it like Nocturne 2. We would find a place on that map, you would hold in a corner, someone holds a window, you shoot. Where like Shino Nume was kind of hard because like there was the four sections of the map so you can go get your perks. And then you had the main, main part. So once you cleared the main part, we were trying to do that strategy by the one perk machine and we tried a strategy by another perk machine and it was like then you had no outlet and it was just kind of tough and then we found that one spot where they had that zipline machine that went back and forth we were like oh shit it's getting over and guys let's get on the um, zipline thing boop and then we go across wait until it gets hectic come back across set up shop again it was just fun it was just cool to find the different strategies in a lot of these maps it really built that the game went from, you know, you stay in a place and you fight. And then the game went to, oh, you stay in a place and fight. But now we're also adding some other interesting concepts here. Like it introduces the PPSH uh, and other, like you got bouncing Bettys, perks, stuff like that. That really, it had traps. Traps were in Varuk. But then Shino Numa's like, okay, now we want to. <laughs> yeah. And then Shino Numa's like, okay, now we've added more traps and the game gets crazier too. And we've unlocked it so the game is like a, a giant circle you can go around and go to the different mm-hmm. areas you want to go to like was it shino numa that had the the logs that come down the the spiked logs or whatever yeah it, it was called the log yeah. flume. it had like two spike logs on either yeah. end but it was like just spinning on like this yeah. circle thing and it'd be it like... was just unreal and it was it was so out of touch with what the game was and you're like i still love it it's still fun it's still <laughs> it's so fun as shit, for sure but um my next one i would have to give it up to was um shanger law Shangri-La was really fun. That was the one in like the Aztec like temple. Yeah. And 
it was cool when they added that mechanic of that monkey that would come and like if there would be like a maxim or a double points or or a nuke that would drop it would come and try and steal that and and run away with it and take it up to the top where you couldn't get it but while he's that, running away with it much. it was changing and so you could time it to kill him for whatever you wanted. Oh, I need a max ammo. I need him to come pick up this double points. Wait until it's a max ammo. Shoot him and then get it. And then, but we had like this whole setup where you were hanging by the water slide, and someone was watching in front by the uh, like the slowing sand and the doors that would change. And then there was just two door, two other windows to worry about. But you could balance it enough that everyone could help each other. And it was just fun. The strategy that was involved with that game and just the overall like the map looked beautiful even at that time and because also, that came out. Shangri La. It was. It was also one of the games that first allowed you to go past four perks. Was it? One of the first few, yeah. So, like, you could get, like, all eight on that one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, to round it off here, it's just, like, a classic zombie map that even, like, non-gamers really know about. Even is Transit. Transit is such an iconic map that no one will ever forget because, like, it changed up the game. Like, you, you start off in the bus station. And then once you got out of the bus station, that bus was like, beep, beep, I'm leaving without you. <laughs> I ain't stopping. Yeah. You better hop on the bus or you get left behind and you by yourself. Because that changed yeah. up the game because, like, you couldn't run from one section to the other. I mean, you could, um, but not at first because of the the things that would call, crawl on your back and start fucking you up. Um, yeah. But it's just like, oh, damn, I got to hold off in this one area by myself because if I go down, I'm fucked. I'm dead. <laughs> So it yeah. was really creepy for that map. And then it had like the I town and the farm. The and it was just different things that you could do. Like in the town, that's where you could actually deposit your, your money and then your teammates could get it. Or you can deposit money. So when you can actually play the map again at like a different day, you could take money out that you stored in there. It was so cool for different stuff like that. You know what, my, what map really like really got me going? Moon for a while there. That oh, was yeah. a crazy map. The fact that everyone's like slowed outside and it got <laughs> it, it. It was it was a little it was a little silly that you could hear outside on the moon, but the fact that it just like they tried to make it feel like you were in space. <laughs> right. And yeah, that was, was a lot of fun. That was one of the first maps I think you could also like complete the game too, because I think there was an Easter egg there. You could actually finish the game. We never mm -hmm. did it, but right, I yeah, never did it because you could um you can launch the rocket to go blow up uh. The moon, I think it was in, I forget like what happened. Like you can launch the rocket. Cause like, remember you took the teleporter back to area 52 or whatever it was. Yeah. So like, it, it, it was definitely a fun map for sure. It was, it was definitely a classic that I really enjoyed, especially with the weapon that um would make them like all blow up like into like a balloon and then explode. It was pretty yeah. funny. And then like the, the, um, the excavators that would destroy the base that you were at and it would like change it from like, um, it would depressurize the area. So, like, that was important to go turn off that machine, because if you didn't, you're fucked. Yeah. Because it would actually cut off an area that you can no longer get to, to the perks or anything like that. And there was no way of reverting it. Once it went through, that was it. That's That that excavator was sitting there, and that was it. Could not move yeah. it. So, yeah, that no, map was I, a little crazy. I definitely think, for us, Call of Duty was one of those most influential games in, in our development for gaming, as gamers. Mm -hmm. Right, so. and there's so many other maps, man, that we could talk about. Kino de, de Toten, the theater, um, Five, the Pentagon, um, Call of the Dead. When he actually brought George Romero, at, and he had, he was a zombie, and he was walking around with the the light from like a like a movie set, and he's like the original founder of zombies. Like he's like one of the OGs of zombies, the genre of zombies. So it's just like the different things, man, they did in zombies was so much fun, so much fun, but. Nonetheless, I think that was a great question, man. It just brings up a lot of great memories that I know I personally had and definitely with you growing up playing through all the DLCs and whatnot. But uh, you got any last thoughts or comments, remarks, anything? Well, thanks for everyone who came out to watch us. Thanks for seeing us live. For sure. Yeah, thank you everybody who did check us out live and anybody who does check us out later on YouTube. We appreciate all the uh, love and support. Um, these episodes are live every Sunday at 7 p.m., so come check us out for sure. Engage in the conversation. Ask, ask us questions answer some of the questions that we ask ourselves on these like these ones here at the zombie maps it'd be pretty cool to get some interaction on that but uh roger where can we find you at uh, most of you already know but it's twitch.tv slash lunatic underscore oblivion and of course uh you can check me out at twitter at, at uh, mr never chillin underscore xbox is x never space chillin you want a game party up or anything like that uh facebook vic brubacher questions concerns want to come on the show hit me up on there and not worried about my twitch right now like i said last week so 
check us out here on this channel, both for the, the Press Star podcast, the talk show with Vic, and any gaming that we do, whether it's Valorant or any other new single player games that I do decide to stream. But definitely want to thank everyone again. But until next time, peace.